Okay, uh, good afternoon, or even good morning, wherever you might be. If you're uh, watching this in perhaps 2024 or even later, today for us here uh, is 2023, and this is day four of uh, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. So welcome, thanks for joining us. Uh, at this time of the year, when we're in this, uh, this season of autumn and looking towards uh, the fulfilment of God's autumnal holy days, trumpets, atonement, feast of tabernacles, and of course the last great day at, at the end, we tend to focus our minds on the millennium, which is essentially why we're here in many ways. So we look at a, a world to come where there's a great prosperity, where there's peace upon the earth, where there's well-being and health and great music, uh, abundance of crops and so on and so forth, the knowledge of God blanketing the earth as the waters cover the seas. Uh, and of course, a lot of that is, if you think about it, focusing upon the um, the people in the world to come in the millennium, because these are largely physical things. Of course, justice, we talked about yesterday, a world of justice between the people, right, and so on. But of course, for those of us who hope to be there <laughs> as a resurrected uh, changed spirit beings, immortal saints in the world to come. Some of these things like abundance of crops might not be you know, too high in the agenda, but there is, one, so, there is something that we can look forward to as spirit beings as we move into the millennium, into God's kingdom. And that would be, uh, I think, one of the greatest events of all history, the marriage of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, to his bride, that's going to be a super duper big event that lies still somewhere ahead of us. Questions might be, will we be there? And incidentally, where will there be? You know, where is there if you're looking at the marriage of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God? Now, even physically in this life, uh, very often weddings are you know, quite, quite lavish affairs, very important affairs. Uh, you tend to get family invited, uh, friends, colleagues, they can be quite simple weddings, just a handful of people. Some, of course, are, are very lavish. You may have seen you know, some of the footage off and on of, say, the, uh, the British uh, royal weddings that occasionally take place. You know, you've got millions watching. Uh, you've got choirs singing, great cathedrals, lots of colour and flags and so on and so forth. They are major, but can you imagine uh, what the marriage of Jesus Christ might look like. I would think that's quite likely to be the biggest celebration perhaps in all eternity, or at least, you know, one of the, the bigger ones. Uh, and it's something that you and I are invited to. Jesus Christ be marrying saints, immortal saints. He's an immortal spirit being. He's going to marry clearly immortal spirit beings as well. So you and I are invited and it's very special. And yet, strangely enough, I think it's quite curious in Scripture, there's only one short passage that mentions this incredible wedding, the greatest wedding of all time. So let's have a look at that in Revelation chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 7 through 9. I might have thought, well, I would have thought there'd be lots of references to it, you know, here and there and here and there. We can build up a great picture as we put the Scriptures together, but no, just one brief passage so Revelation chapter 19, which of course is taking us way into the far distant future. Well, I say far distant future, I mean, I shouldn't really say that because I'm certainly hopeful that things will be moving pretty swiftly from this point on. So maybe not too far at all. That's for sure. I'll... Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready, she's prepared. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And of course Jesus is going to marry his, his wife, his bride, the saints. Verse 9, Then he, the angel, said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So people, exact numbers we do not know for sure, are invited to, to marry the Lamb. Invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Other translations say the wedding feast. The word supper is open to 
debate. <laughs> Some people's supper is nine o'clock in the evening when they have a glass of Ovaltine and a digestive biscuit. Some people's supper is a big meal at you know six thirty in the evening. But uh, perhaps you prefer a wedding feast. Or another translation is wedding banquet. Because it's going to be a banquet. It's going to be the wedding of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, to his, to his bride. Now, how long is that going to last? I think in, in biblical days, uh, a wedding feast could last for a number of days, like two, three days, four days a week. I imagine the emperors and so on of Babylon and Syria, they probably had weddings that might last a week or more. Lots of banqueting, uh, uh, feasting, drinking, who knows what not. How long will their wedding celebration of the Lamb last? Don't know, but I suspect quite a while because <laughs> it's a huge event, right? And we all, all want to be there, right? So there's only this one direct reference. That's it. It's two or three verses to the wedding of the Lamb and the invitation to come to the wedding banquet. But, right, there is a, a parable that Jesus gave that sort of adds a little bit of detail. And I think it's fair to look at the parable as having, you know, some relevance to the wedding of the king's son. So let's turn to Matthew 22, a parable that clearly the Lord Jesus gave. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 1 to 14, which is, I think, the entire parable. <clears throat> uh, all of the parables typically have just one key primary meaning and Jesus typically explains what the meaning is but quite often most of us <laughs> tend to look at other details in the parable try and look for symbolism there and, and uh, try to interpret additional features of the parable and that's, that's quite legitimate I think here and there but we shouldn't forget that the main purpose of a parable is, is sort of single meaning that Jesus usually plainly tells us uh, and not try to over-engineer all the little details in the story that Jesus gives. But let's start in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them, them being the priests and uh, the Pharisees. So this is not directly a parable to his own disciples. I mean, they were there listening, so they'd get something from it. Uh, and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. So you can see how this quite easily can be used uh, to illustrate the wedding of Jesus Christ because it says the kingdom of heaven is like. So not just a, a, a sort of random parable about stuff happening in towns and cities and fields. Jesus is talking about this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a king who has arranged a marriage for his son. So, okay, God the Father arranges a marriage for his son, right? This is picturing the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And he sent uh, out to invite those who were invited to the wedding, but they were not willing to come. That's sort of the underlying primary theme of the parable. God wants people to come to this wedding of his son, well, the king does, I'm saying God, but I think that's quite reasonable. And they don't want to come. Why not? Why wouldn't you go to a... I mean, most people in this country, if they're invited to the royal wedding of, say, you know, Prince William uh, or whoever it might have been, oh, wow, fantastic. Let me get off to the you know, tailors and get a good suit, a nice dress, lovely hat with a big feather in it. I've been invited to a royal wedding. Oh, my word. Open me the photographs, right? Uh, but these don't want to come. Jesus making a point. Verse 4, again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my banquet, my oxen and fatted calf are killed. All things are ready. Come to the wedding. That's the king's order. Right? But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, uh, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, this time not his servants, destroyed those murderers, burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited 
were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So again, the primary purpose is showing the unwillingness of people to come to the king's wedding. He's having to send out again and again and again. Most people can't be bothered. Some are actually quite hostile. All right. And so the king deals with them via his armies. And now he sends out more. Bring people in to my wedding. But they don't want to come. Or if they do come, we have the example now of a, of a guy who turns up representative of others who turns up but is, um, you know, unwashed, uh, wearing dirty rags, and uh, totally inappropriate for a wedding feast of a king and the royal son. So, verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment, and he was speechless, meaning he'd got no excuse. There was no justification. I think the the etiquette of the day was that uh, the king would actually make uh, garments available so that you looked super smart when you arrived at the wedding, right? And he, he goes out to scrutinize all the guests, make sure everything's this is a super wedding. It's my son, you know, the royal son. His wedding's coming up, and make sure everybody looks neat and clean and tidy and no ruffians. Right, no scabs in here. And he looks around and, oh, hang on, what's this guy doing? He's, he's not attired for my son's wedding. And he goes and says, well, what is this? There are garments there, why haven't you put one on? And the guy says, speechless. He just means, <laughs> no excuse, nothing he can say. It's just either apathy or it's hostility or whatever it is, but he's not ready. So the king wants people to come and they keep refusing. And those that do turn up, because this would be just, I guess, an example, not ready, not dressed, not prepared. Verse 13, Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. You don't want to be in outer darkness. Not a great place to be. And Jesus concludes, There will be weeping, and a gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So that's a parable that I think we can easily apply to the marriage of Jesus Christ, the king's you know, great son. And of course, many are called, it would seem, to be a part of uh, this, this wedding when it takes place. But few are chosen because they don't, don't respond, uh, they don't come at all. Too busy. Got my business to look after. Got my farm. You know, got to walk my dogs. Got to do X, Y, and Z. Or, right, uh, I come along, but you better take me just as you find me, God. Just as I am, <laughs> without one flea. I got, no, it's not the way God works. Right, so we can understand other bits and pieces of the parable, but primarily the parable is saying most people won't turn up, or won't turn up suitably attired. That's the key meaning of the parable. But I think, like I say, we can, we can apply that parable easily to, to Jesus Christ <clears throat> and his wedding. Now, I think, you know, that, that God the Father will play a major role in this wedding of his son when it takes place. He is God the Father. This is his, his son in whom he's well pleased, who's going to get married to the saints, to, to the brethren to the bride forevermore. So I think, you know, God's going to be very much involved just as the king there came out to the hall and looked around to make sure everything was as it should be, right? And God the Father, I think, will do that. I can't imagine God the Father missing the wedding of Jesus Christ. I think he'll be there and I think he will officiate. The right word? Yeah. God will perform the ceremony. He's going to have there's his son, there's the bride, all these people who are ready, chosen, and God will perform that ceremony at some point. So if we're at the wedding, which uh, I guess we hope we will be, then we'll meet the Father at that point. 
right? Because he's going to be there, carrying out the wedding. But when is this going to take place? When does Jesus marry his, his bride? Well, clearly after he's, his coming, but his coming is a bit elastic in, the, in, in timing. And where will Jesus marry his bride? Uh, in, the, in the earthly Jerusalem? Uh, in the clouds when the saints are caught up to meet Jesus in the air? Uh, up in the third heaven where God dwells today? Whereabouts? And I think to try and answer that question as to where the wedding is likely to take place, we need to just refresh our understanding of, of the timeline of Jesus' return, Jesus coming back. Now, for a long time, I, I thought Jesus just sort of set off one day from heaven and zoom to the earth, picking up the saints as he came and he lands on the earth within 10 hours of leaving heaven, or six hours, whatever, right? If you do that, you're get hopelessly confused because it doesn't work. I've tried it for decades. That's how I misunderstood the scriptures. That's what I read in articles. That's sort of what I heard, or at least that's what I assumed I'd heard, right? But Jesus, because I couldn't quite get my mind around the fact that, well, does Jesus have one second coming or does he come a second time, a third time, a fourth time, and a fifth time? It's the wrong question to ask because Jesus' second coming isn't in one day any more than his first coming was in one day. We all talk about Jesus' first coming, but how long did that last? Well, over 30 years. Jesus came as an infant baby, all right, uh, on Christmas Eve. <laughs> as the snow fell gently around Bethlehem well not but Jesus came as a baby and he grew up as a teenager and then eventually uh, he was baptised by John the Baptist and his ministry started Jesus' first coming lasted over 30 years All right, Jesus' second coming is just a single coming but I think it lasts about 12 months right about 12 months from when he comes to collect the saints to when he comes back as a warrior king to destroy the wicked on the earth about 12 months, we'll see how that, that works out. So the key understanding of uh, the book of Revelation, as I've explained often in the past, is that there are 21 key events in the book of Revelation. You've got those 21 in order, uh, you can get a reasonable way through the book of Revelation. All right? Still a few iffy bits here and there, but 21 key events. Seven seals, followed by seven trumpets, followed by seven bowls of wrath. Right, 21 key events, right? And let's look at Jesus coming back over that period. Let's look to Matthew 24, because we've said that Jesus, well, I've said that Jesus will marry immortal saints. You know, the holy Jesus Christ is not going to marry carnal, physical flesh and blood. So if he's going to marry immortal saints, glorified saints, Right? When do the saints become immortal? Let's look at Matthew 24, verses 27 to 31. For as, Jesus speaking, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming, parousia, of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. A bit of a mysterious comment. But this is the coming of the Lord Jesus, right? Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's clearly, I hope it's clear at least, that's the heavenly signs, the cosmic signs. That is seal number six. Can't obviously go there now. They get sealed one, you know, the white horse and the red horse and the black horse and the green horse and the martyrdom of the saints. And you get to number six, it's these heavenly signs. So Jesus' coming is at the time of the heavenly signs. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. There's some real judgment heading their way uh, imminently. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And Jesus will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together, saw that yesterday, I think, Episunagogi, his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven 
to the other. So Jesus comes down at the cosmic signs, the heavenly signs, sends his angels out, great trumpet blast, and they gather together the saints. That's at uh, the sixth seal, the sixth of the 21 key events in the book of Revelation, right? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, which we've seen recently, of course, which just repeats the same episode, slightly different words. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, the, the, the rapture passage, as we mentioned. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, who have already died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, express teaching of Jesus, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, parousia, will by no means precede those who are, are dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, just read that in Matthew 24, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with this great trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Which is just repeating what we read in Matthew 24. Jesus coming and the saints being changed or resurrected if they're already dead, meeting Jesus in the clouds. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verses 50 to 54, just again making the point that the saints are going to be changed, either resurrected, or if they're alive at the time of Jesus coming down from the clouds towards the earth, then they'll be changed. Changed into what? <laughs> changed into immortal glorified spirit beings to whom Jesus can then expect to be married. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Or I'll stick in there or marry Jesus Christ. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Some will, but not all. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. We just read that in First Thessalonians. And we shall be changed. We just read that in Thessalonians. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And as incorruptible and immortal spirit beings at this trumpet blast, as we're dead or raised and those alive at the time are changed, we're then capable of being married to Jesus Christ. Right? It does mention there the last trumpet. Don't do what I did for decades and assume that's the seventh trumpet of Revelation because your brain will explode trying to fit it all together. It doesn't work. But there's no way when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, roughly 56 AD, that he knew about any seven trumpets and any seventh trumpet. But that was John in the book of Revelation about 40 odd years later, 35 years later. right? So that's, that's not the seventh trumpet of Revelation. And if you try to squeeze those in, like I say, your, your brain will explode. <clears throat> so the saints meet Jesus Christ in the clouds, which I think we just read two or three times there, uh, which is fantastic. We meet Jesus Christ in the clouds and we see around us other saints. Do we recognize them? Because God's put that into our minds. Oh, there's Moses and there's King David. And there, oh, there's Paul. Uh, oh, you know, there's, there's Apollo and, and uh, you know, there's, there's Lydia and so on. Do, do we do that? Don't know. But it's going to be a good time. Then what? We meet Jesus Christ in the clouds. Perhaps there's some music, dancing. <laughs> Who knows? But then what? Do we come straight down to the earth at that point? All right? 
Um, well, what about the wedding? If we come straight onto the earth, to a, a world that's still with you know, war and invasions and death and, and uh, destruction, is that where we get you know, married at the battlefield? Does God come down to the battlefield, battlefield earth, and uh, carry out his wedding there? Um, or, or, or what? You know, or, or things, are things delayed, right? Um, I don't think God comes down to a, an earth that's still under invasion and attack and demonic locusts are about to release and so on. Don't think that's going to happen, right? I don't think we get married in the clouds, just wispy clouds around us. don't think that's how it happens. So if, if those aren't obvious alternatives, then it just leaves you with, well, I guess, the wedding must take place in heaven. In God's heaven, that's the only place left. Destroyed earth, or an earth still being destroyed, or just wispy clouds, neither stand out, I think, as, as a reasonable place for the best, greatest wedding of all man's history. So therefore, it must be in the clouds. And then in olden days, my brain would start freezing up because, but your scripture says that in that day, Jesus' feet stand on the Mount of Olives. So is, is the wedding uh, on the earth, the Mount of Olives, or, or is it heaven? What, what happens here? And I was quite confused. Look at your Revelation 11, because there is a scripture that says Jesus' feet stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which splits in two, but that's not the day Jesus comes back for his saints. All right? It's going to see that's about a year, roughly a year or so after Jesus' coming with that great trumpet blast and the change of the saints. So Revelation 11, let's read verses 15 and 16 just. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And uh, the 24 elders fell down and worshipped Jesus Christ at that point. Right? So this is the, um, the official time that Jesus Christ becomes King of Kings and Lord of Lords at this time. He takes over the kingdoms of the world at the seventh trump. Right? But you need to understand, of course, that's the seventh trumpet. That's a long time after the first trumpet. Trumpet one and two and three and four and five and six and seven. Right? The first trumpet starts after Jesus coming. You know, Jesus coming is at the cosmic signs, the heavenly signs, which is the sixth seal. The same day that the saints are caught away up to the clouds to meet Jesus is when the day of the Lord starts, the self-same day. And we've covered that before, right? And the self-same day, the first trumpet blows. And then the second trumpet, and then the third trumpet, and the fourth trumpet. The fifth trumpet lasts five months. That's the demonic locusts which torment men for five months and men seek to die but can't. So that's five months in duration. Now you get the sixth trumpet. Now we're at the seventh trumpet here. Seventh trumpet is, I'm going to say broadly, 12 months or so after the first trumpet. 12 months or so roughly after Jesus coming to collect the saints. About a year. All right? And after the trumpets, we've still got time to go because you've then got uh, the, the bowls of wrath, the vials of wrath. Look at Revelation 15 and verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. The wrath of God starts with the trumpets. Trumpet one, which is fire, and two, three, four, five, lasting five months, and six, and seven, and then immediately the, the last seven plagues take place, which complete, bring to an end the wrath of God. Let's look at Revelation 16, just to touch on the, the bowls of wrath. I'm not going to examine them in any detail. Chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. So the balls start. The point I just want to make here is they take time. 
right? None of this is all happening in just one 10 hour day as Jesus zooms from heaven to the earth on the same day and everything is somehow got to be compressed into that. Seven trumpets have blown, which has taken quite a while. Uh, and now you've got seven bowls, which take a while. I don't know how long they take. The second bowl, we won't read, that's the oceans turning to blood. The third angel pours his blood out, the rivers, his bowl out, and the rivers turn to blood. Uh, the fourth angel pours his bowl out, and the sun scorches the earth, especially where the beast is. The fifth uh, angel pours his bowl out, and we get darkness on the kingdom of the beast. All of this is taking time. Now, I don't know whether it's a week each or, or two weeks each, right? But it's time, some length of time. And then we get to, uh, to uh, chapter 16 and verses 12. We're now at the sixth bowl. Let's read that one. Verses 12 through 16. <clears throat> then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's the devil, the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. So the beast, the great military leader, the sort of false messiah, and his religious associate. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, that sounds like it's international, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 16, and they gathered them, the armies of the world, together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, I think that takes time as well, because if these spirits of demons are going out to the whole world, to China and, and uh, to India and uh, across to Russia and down to South Africa, to get them together to, to battle, that's going to take time to convince and persuade all the kings and their armies to do that, and then, of course, to make that journey. So point I'm making is that seven trumpets takes quite a while. The seven trumpets start at Jesus coming for his saints. Then they take a while. And then the bowls take a while, right? And at this point here, all the armies of the whole world are gathered together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, which is another name, I think, for Jerusalem. It's a Hebrew name. It means Mount of Assembly, which is Jerusalem, Mount Zion. So all the armies gather together at, uh, at Armageddon at the timing of the sixth bowl of wrath and that's the point where Jesus Christ and his saints go out to battle verse 14 says they gather the uh, armies of the world to the battle of that great day of God Almighty this is the climactic battle of all time between God and the whole world and its kings and armies and the dragon and the beast false prophet they're all gathered together against God this is the battle of his great day. We can see that in Zechariah 14. Zechariah chapter 14. Same battle, same event. Let's read verses 1 through 4. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And uh, your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem, or Armageddon is another word for that. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle, the great climactic day of the battle of the Lord and in that day in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives so that's a long time after Jesus coming Jesus comes at the heavenly signs snatches away the saints then you have seven trumpets then you have seven bowls and at the sixth bowl Jesus Christ comes back and fights against the armies at Armageddon at Jerusalem and his feet stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. So yeah, Jesus' feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which cleaves in two and so on. But that's about a year-ish. I mean, it might be 11 and a half months, it might be 13 months, 
But it's about a year after Jesus' coming, right? That's how you put these things, you line them up. Uh, we'll look at verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Right? So, I'm saying roughly a year has passed. Uh, where's Jesus and his bride? The saints that he caught away, <laughs> you know, the sixth um, event of the 21. The battle here is event 20 of the 21. After that comes a great earthquake and hailstones, right? That's the 21st event. But there you go. Between the sixth event, Jesus comes, and the 20th event, his fighting at Armageddon and his feet standing on the Mount of Olives on that day. Where, where, where's the church been? Where have the saints been, right? Where's Jesus taken his saints in that time? I think the obvious answer is to heaven, right? That's essentially the place of safety. If you're a saint, you'll go through the door into heaven and be there uh, with the Father, uh, with the resurrected saints, with the living saints who were changed at that time, uh, with God. Great. I mean, we're going to meet, well, thousands, tens of thousands, numbers are open to dispute. We'd probably get a tour of heaven, I would have thought. Why not? We're going to be there for a human year, you know, more or less. Uh, it's going to be great to meet the Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, to get to start to talk to people, uh, find out how to use your glorified spirit body, you know, hear the angels, see the cherubim, oh my word, how many faces have they got, right, all that stuff. See the white horses up in heaven, right, ride them, perhaps, before we make our way back to the earth. Let's go back to Revelation 19 and then pick up how the uh, wedding of the Lamb now fits in. Because we're there for, I say we're there, I certainly hope I'm there, that we're going to be there for about a year from Jesus' first coming at event number six to Jesus' final coming at event uh, 20. Chapter 19, uh, let's read just verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God. So question is, who is this great multitude that are praising God in this way, right? Um, the Greek for multitude is, uh, is the word ochlos. It's used spell O-C-H-L-O-S, ochlos. In the King James Version it says uh, much people rather than great multitude. But ochlos is a word used 176 times in the New Testament. So it's quite a common word. And every single time it's used, it means people, human beings, people, right? So I'm going to suggest at this point, but hopefully establish it in a few minutes, that this great multitude are the saints in heaven. I heard a loud voice of a great multitude, brackets, the saints of God in heaven, crying out, Alleluia, salvation, and so on and so forth, right? And this is just uh, shortly before the wedding takes place. Now, the same expression, a great multitude, which I think helps to support that it's people, resurrected saints, we can find in Revelation chapter 7. So we go back to chapter 7. Let's read verses uh, <clears throat> 9 to 10. Uh, chapter 7 comes after the heavenly signs. You know, chapter 6 is where we got all the seals, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the green horse, blah, 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 down to seal number 6, which is the cosmic signs, the heavenly signs. That's what I've just said, that the, Jesus collects his saints at that point. And this is just immediately after that in the chronology. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude. Same expression. A great ochlos, which no one could number. And where do they come from? Well, from all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues. So they're obviously people, human beings, from different tribes, different nations on the earth, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Pretty much what we just read in chapter 19. 
So the great multitude are described here as folk from all nations, but they're standing before God's throne and before the Lamb. So again, in heaven. That's, I think, the only reasonable way you can interpret that. These are the resurrected, changed people from different tribes and tongues and languages and nations standing before God, and it comes just after the heavenly saints, which is where Jesus comes and collects his, his saints. Look at verses um, 13 to 14. I, again, I think this makes it plain. Then one of the elders uh, answered and saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? Where did they come from? I said to him, I haven't got a clue. Sir, surely you know. <laughs> Hopefully, sir, you know, because I don't. And he said to me, well, actually, yes, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's who they are. They are people who've been rescued and delivered from the great tribulation, actually of all time, I think, and, and now stand before the throne before the Lamb of God in heaven, and they are the great multitude. Okay, so let's go back to chapter 19. <clears throat> let's read verses uh, 1 to 9 all the way through. So again, the great multitude is not going to be angels or other unknown creatures in heaven. These are the saints, the first fruits, those who have been invited and are fit and ready to marry Jesus Christ. They have on the proper garments for a wedding. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot, chapter 18, who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her, the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Again, chapter 18. And this is just very, very, very shortly after that. They can still see the smoke going up. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. Same phrase. As the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. They're wearing proper wedding apparel. They're good to go. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So, that's the saints in heaven, the great multitude. And that's them about to commence the wedding banquet as they're married, I guess, by the Father to Jesus Christ, greatest wedding of all time. And uh, I think something that's worth thinking about is uh, how many weddings will Jesus have? I think this is it. Jesus gets married to his wife. That's it. So only those who are there I think, participate in the wedding. Only the first fruits, only today's saints, or you know, New Testament saints, plus Abraham, Isaac, and so on. But the rest in the millennium, when they live out their lives and, and, and get changed into spirit being, I don't think they become Christ's wife because the wedding's over. The wedding took place uh, before the millennium starts, I think, shortly at least. So all of those who are saved during the millennium, all of those who are given the opportunity in the great white throne judgment, the last great day, and, and, and come into God's family, I don't think they become the wife. The wife is only, it's one of the benefits, the, the blessings, one of the rewards of today's first fruits is they become the wife of Jesus Christ, and they only 
and that relationship extends into eternity. So if you're called today and uh, you're ready today and you marry Jesus Christ at this point in time, you're separated in a sense, in a very special way, very special relationship for all time. Let's look at uh, verses six, 11 to 16. <clears throat> Because sometime after this wedding, we move towards this great battle at Armageddon. The wedding takes place before that. You can see that here because you just follow the chronology, verses 11 through 16. So the wedding is mentioned there in verses 7, 8, 9, and so on. But now verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True and in Righteousness, he judges and makes war. The big war, big fight being at Armageddon, which is just about to, to start. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven, I think that's the saints. Angels might join, but I think that's specifically the saints there, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, recognize that, followed him on white horses. So we've learned to ride. <laughs> if you're a saint in heaven, you've learned to ride a white horse. You know, at last, I'm only ridden a horse for an hour once in my life. Feast of Tabernacles, 1974. It took me three or four days to recover. My legs wouldn't work properly after I got off the horse. Big horse. Well, you're only little. I'm only a little. It seems a very big horse. But here, uh, the saints will be mounted on white horses. I take that to be literal. I mean, not physical flesh and blood horses, but I, mean, I think they're. I think much that we see on the earth today is is patterned after what's what's in heaven. Um, verse 14 again. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, certainly initially. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then if we carry on reading, we won't need to do that. Jesus returns to the battle at Armageddon and slays the beast, or captures the beast, the false prophet, thrown into the lake of fire, all the kings of the earth and their armies are destroyed. Right? That's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Right? And Jesus returns with his saints, to whom he's just got married. So I guess one of the first things we do as the bride of Christ is go to war. <laughs> so if you put the timeline together, that's how it all makes sense, I think. So what you've got here is uh, the resurrection of the saints, that's when Jesus comes back to collect them at the heavenly signs, the sixth event of the 21. Jesus then turns back, goes into heaven, and somewhere in the ensuing roughly 12 months, the wedding of the Lamb takes place. Now at the end of that, after the seven trumpets, one of which alone lasts five months, after the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath, or at least six of them, Jesus Christ returns as a warrior king with his armies, his, uh, his, his new wife and goes to battle, destroys the wicked of the earth, and at long last the millennium can start, right? So that's something to look forward to. Uh, not the battle necessarily, but I think in a sense, if, if you're destroying those who destroy the earth, if you're cleansing the earth of all the wicked, the kings, the beast, the false prophet, all the perverts, I guess you could say degenerates, if you're cleansing the earth of all of those who refuse to repent to God, then you can start the millennium in a pretty good place. Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, with his wife beside him, going off to educate, transform and change the world, making it into the beautiful, peaceful world to come. And so it's something to look forward to, right? That, that you and I can be part of the special relationship as the wife of Jesus Christ forevermore. Very special, because nobody else gets to do that as far as I can make out. Okay, with that we'll conclude today's message.